Um, so yes, we're moving um, from the lightning session directly uh, to session three, uh, which is already uh, the final session of the, the conference. Uh, session three is devoted to new challenges for macroprudential policies. And we have three papers in the session uh, uh, that are uh, each, each very interesting uh, on a range of topics. Uh, the first one is on uh, liquidity risk and an interest rate risk and uh, the interaction between the two. Um, then we'll have a paper on uh, how banks respond to climate stress tests as a second paper. And then we'll have a, a paper also looking at the nexus between uh, banks and, and non-banks. Uh, one paper we'll have just before the coffee break. Uh, and uh, this is the paper on banking on uninsured uh, deposits. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, Alexei Savov uh, has uh, uh, come and come come all the way from uh, New York, uh, NYU, uh, to present the paper here, and we'll have Agnese uh, Leonello uh, from the ECB to to discuss uh, the paper. So, uh, uh, Alexi, this, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Erland, and thank the organizers for inviting me to present this paper. It's a uh, joint work with uh, Emma Drexler at Wharton and uh, my colleagues at NYU, Philip Schnabel and Olivier Wang. Um, so this paper was very much inspired by the events of uh, March 2023 in the banking world. So let me just remind you briefly uh, what happened. Um, since early 2022, um, the Fed in the U.S. Uh, raised interest rates very aggressively up to uh, five and a quarter percent or so. Um, Long-term interest rates, which in part are driven by the expected uh, path of short rates in the future, also went up um, by something like two and a half percentage points. Um, now, what does this have to do with banks? Uh, well, going into this period, uh, banks in the U.S. Uh, had about $17 trillion worth of long-term uh, loans and securities, and the average duration on those was something around four years. And you can do the math, it's pretty simple. Um, if uh, uh, rates have increased by 2.5% um, on uh, four-year duration assets, that means that the fall in the value of those assets is about 10%. And 10% of $17 trillion is about $1.17 trillion of um, implied losses on, uh, on those long-term loans and securities. Uh, this is a very big number. Uh, it's big uh, just in raw dollar terms, but it's also very large compared to the amount of equity that that the banks in the U.S. had, which is about 2.2 trillion. Um, and so um, the obvious concern, therefore, is that well, maybe there's um, uh, widespread insolvency uh, resulting from this kind of uh, large loss. Uh, indeed, you know, here it's a little. Um, um, a representative uh, quote from Larry Summers, who said, um, specifically talking about SVB, that SVB committed one of the most elementary errors in banking, borrowing money in the short term and investing in the long term. Uh, when interest rates went up, the assets lost their value and put the institution in a problematic situation. So, you know, all banks borrow short and lend long. So it's like, okay, gulp. Uh, uh, it sounds like uh, uh, it would be more widespread than that. Um, so, so it's a pretty concerning. All right, um, you know, the most elementary error in banking is banking. That sounds, that sounds like a problem. Okay, um, well, let's see what, what happened. Um, here's one piece of uh, interesting data is the stock market. What does the stock market think about all this? And the stock market wasn't very worried. So like bank stocks actually, um, despite, so as interest rates are going up, right? This is the Fed funds rate in black. Bank stocks roughly track the overall market. Um, um, didn't go down much. The market went down some, but so did bank stocks. And so um, there wasn't much evidence that the market was pricing in these very large uh, losses from the rise in interest rates. Um, once SVB happened and there was a run, and this will be a big focus of the talk, then bank stocks dropped and, and haven't really recovered. So it was more the run that, that, that hit the uh, uh, bank stocks as opposed to the uh, uh, implied losses um, from the rise in interest rates. So what's going on? Why would that be? Why would the, the, the market be kind of whistling past the graveyard, as they say? Well, it turns out that there's uh, more going on than just the losses on the asset side of the balance sheet. And what's going on is on the deposit side, on the liability side of the balance sheet. 
what happened and what always kind of happens is that as the Fed was raising interest rates here, the black line, again, the Fed funds rate starting in early 2022, uh, sure, uh, banks were making losses on the asset side, but they were making greater profits uh, on the liability side. And the reason for that is that deposit interest rates uh, here, I've picked out three representative deposit products. I, I, I know, you know, slightly different names in Europe and in different countries. Uh, but uh, checking accounts is kind of like the most liquid demand deposit you can think of. Savings account is still, uh, you can take it out any time, but you can't write checks against it. And then time deposits where you lock in uh, your money for term. Uh, those three pretty representative. And you can see that they went from paying zero when the Fed funds rate was zero. So banks weren't earning any profits on those deposits. In fact, during that period, given that there's costs in operating deposits, uh, uh, branches and so on, they're probably losing money on them. But since the Fed started raising interest rates, deposit rates staying low while the Fed funds rate is going high, there's a very large spread that is opening up uh, between the market rate and the rate that they're paying on deposits. And that represents a, so a very large and significant source of profits for the banks. So uh, uh, the deposit fr uh, franchise, in a sense, provides a natural hedge to the asset side of, uh, of banks from uh, increasing interest rates. Um, I haven't looked too closely at Europe, but I do have this chart showing a similar picture in, in European countries. Of course, there's a lot of variation, you know, in terms of uh, deposit betas, I should define what that is. Deposit beta is like the fraction of um, by which the deposit rate goes up per 100 basis point increase in the policy rate. So not too different. Um, now, so, so if you do a little bit of math back of the envelope here, you find that um, on the deposit side, the picture looks uh, like this. There are, again, about $17 trillion or so of deposits. This is just back to the US. Uh, if you assume an average beta of 0.4, why 0 0.4? 0 0.4 is actually kind of the historical average. One of the puzzling things recently is that betas have been a little bit lower. Uh, but let's say, perhaps to be conservative, or perhaps just um, things revert to the historical mean, let's say a beta of 0.4, uh, then you'll find that when the interest rate is at five and a half as it is now, the short rate, then, with, then the banks are earning 0.6, right? What they're not paying, uh, the, so if they're paying 0.4, what they're not paying 0.6 is what they're earning, which gives them a deposit spread of about 3.3%. This is average across all the different types of deposits. And 3.3% on $17 trillion is $560 billion a year uh, in increased uh, profitability of the deposit franchise. So that is a very large amount. In fact, if you think that that will be sustained for three years or so, then would fully and maybe even more than fully offset the losses uh, on the asset side, which were about $1.7 trillion, if you recall. And so there's these kind of two sides of the seesaw. As interest rates went up, yes, the assets are losing value, but the deposit franchise is going up in value, and the two are kind of similar. Um, and, and so that could explain why uh, bank stocks held up pretty well, even as interest rates rose. Now, um, just one point I want to make, because it will come, come in later, is that in a sense, given this behavior of deposits, um, it's... What we've said so far is that that helps to offset the losses on the asset side. But you might be thinking, well, it would still be better not to have the losses, right? Like maybe if they just stayed in short assets, then they wouldn't have the losses to need. You know, they could just have the profits without the losses. Uh, the answer is that banks kind of don't uh, can't just go short on the asset side of the balance sheet. This is something that we focused in an earlier paper is because like I said, deposit franchise is very expensive to operate. And so what happens is when interest rates go down, it starts to, uh, it, it, the value declines and could turn negative. And so you actually need long-term assets to offset the decline in value in case interest rates go down. Now in the world that we live in, interest rates went up. And so uh, we have the opposite problem where assets are going down, deposit franchise is going up. But the alternative scenario would have been if interest rates go down, right? If we uh, uh, or just even stayed very low for a long time, we would have the opposite problem where banks would be unprofitable if they were uh, holding only short-term assets. And so uh, those really two sides of, this, of the seesaw really do uh, hedge each other. Okay. What we're going to do in this paper, what's new, uh, and the, the, it's kind of clear in uh, having uh, seen what happened in March, is that, sure, the deposit franchise uh, provides banks with a hedge uh, toward interest rate risk. Uh, but of course, that is only true if depositors actually stay in the bank in the state of the world in which uh, assets have gone down in value. 
right? So uh, depositors have to remain in the bank. And so that means that uh, the hedge that they provide uh, is potentially vulnerable. It can be undermined uh, by outflows of deposits. And uh, broadly speaking, there are two types of outflows, and we talk about both in the paper. The first are just pure outflows that are just purely driven by the rise in interest rates. There's something that we did in our earlier work called the deposits channel of monetary policy, which just says as deposit spreads, when interest rates go up and deposit spreads widen, some people respond by taking their money out and putting them in money market funds, etc. Banks are generally okay with this because they make so much more money on the ones that stay that it's actually profit maximizing to, 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 to let some go uh, in exchange for making more money on the ones that stay. Uh, but nevertheless, this source of outflow also limits the profitability of the deposit franchise and is potentially uh, hurting the hedge. So we look at that. But the one that is more concerning and the one that was more um, um, sort of nonlinear uh, is the potential for a different type of outflow, not so much people just going for higher rates and money market funds, but literally running on the bank. And of course, that's a bigger issue or mostly an issue for uninsured deposits. And so that's going to be the focus of the talk today. So um, here's the main uh, results that are going to come out of uh, our framework to, to study this risk is that uh, you know, we are all familiar with the diamond and dipvig uh, model of bank runs, the diamond dipvig type runs. Um, and usually what you need in order to get a run in a bank is um, the illiquidity uh, of the loans that the bank has, right? That's the standard diamond dipvig model. Loans are illiquid. So if people take their money out, you have to fire, sell them, and you can, uh, and, and that could, um, uh, uh, and that exposes you to runs in the first place. Hune talked about this in the morning. Um, what uh, comes out of our framework is that the deposit, even if the bank has perfectly liquid loans, uh, in a sense, that's how SVB was. SVB had treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, like some of the most liquid assets in the world. Nevertheless, it suffered a run. Well, our argument is that that's because there's another asset, an intangible asset that the bank has, the deposit franchise. And what I mean by the deposit franchise is the profits that the bank is earning from the deposits. And that is an asset that exposes you to runs if it's uninsured, uh, even if uh, your loans are perfectly liquid. So you're going to get a diamond dipvig type runs even with full liquidity in terms of the, 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 the uh, uh, loans and securities on the bank's balance sheet. So that's uh, one thing that's new. And then the second thing that's new about this, it interacts very naturally with the level of interest rates, right? So uh, because the value of the deposit franchise rises with interest rates, right? The spreads get bigger. It becomes more valuable to have a deposit franchise. And because the deposit franchise, or if an insured is a runnable asset, that that means that the risk of a run, the liquidity risk of the bank, is going to be increasing with interest rates. So immediately get a nexus of monetary policy, right, the level of interest rates, and financial stability, the run risk or liquidity risk of the banking system. So that's going to, those two are going to be inextricably linked, um, which is not always true, uh, you know, in, in Diamond Divic. It's specific, specific to this type of asset, the deposit franchise. We're also going to highlight issues that arise for the bank uh, uh, internally, which is the bank faces a kind of risk management dilemma. On the one hand, it wants to hedge uh, to uh, interest rates, and for that it needs long-term assets because the deposits having these insensitive uh, rates on the liability side make you want to hold insensitive um, um, uh, assets with insensitive cash flows on the asset side, right? Uh, so you need some long-term assets to hedge the bank uh, to interest rates. However, um, when you do that, that means that when interest rates rise, the assets fall and the deposit franchise goes up. Overall, you're hedged to interest rates. However, you become exposed to a run. And so hedging to interest rate leaves you unhedged to runs. And the reverse is also true. Hedging to runs leaves you unhedged to interest rate risk. So that's the dilemma. You can't do both, or at least it would be costly to do both. What I mean by costly, you have to raise additional capital. And either... Um, and so the, the way to solve this problem, and this is a costly solution, I don't mean to sell it as, oh, it's, uh, it's done, open and shut. It's a costly solution is for the bank to have something that looks like an option on interest rates. Basically, you need an asset like an option uh, whose value doesn't go down when interest rates um, uh, go up, but also still goes up when interest rates go down. So that's a call option on interest rates. You need something like swap option. Or if it's going to be implemented through capital regulation, there would have to be 
uh, regulatory capital or capital requirement that is itself tied to interest rates. And uh, we talk a lot about having cyclical capital requirements. It's come up many times uh, on the last couple of days. This would be a, a rationale for having them specifically tied not to the state of the economy or not just to the state of the economy, but a component that is literally tied to the level of interest rates. Uh, so that's that, that's also kind of so I'll talk about that. Okay. So uh, here's what the framework looks like. So imagine a bank that has some assets that it comes into the period with and um, some depositor base uh, D. Okay, so banks coming in with, with those assets A and deposits D. Um, there's going to be uh, infinite time T, but uh, all the action is going to be in the beginning. Um, uh, so um, over time, uh, every period, the bank has to pay uh, uh, some deposit rate RD on the deposits that go into that period, right? So there's the deposit rate you have to pay. Uh, in addition, it has to meet any withdrawals X, so change in deposits from period to period have to be paid. Okay. Uh, what's the value of the bank? The value of the bank is the value of the assets minus the value of the liabilities. So the assets are what they are. What about the liabilities? Well, the liabilities are the present value of all the future payouts that the banks have to make, all the future uh, expenses that it will have. What are those expenses? Um, those expenses are the following. So uh, for each period in the future, and there's some stochastic discount factor uh, Q that prices all future payoffs, for each period on the, on the future, for the amount of deposits that the bank goes into that period with, it's going to have to pay the deposit rate, okay, uh, whatever that is. On top of that, it's going to have to pay little c. This is the operating cost of running the deposit franchise. Having branches, having a deposit franchise, attracting depositors, marketing, etc. This is costly. Banks spend something on the order of 2% of assets to, 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 to run that thing. And so that's the, what little c is capturing. Uh, in addition, you have to meet any withdrawals, withdrawals that happen in time zero, or any subsequent withdrawals as well. And liabilities are the present value of all these expenses that you have. Okay. Um, it's actually... Um, now, now let's make some simplifying assumptions. It's enough to get all the ideas across. Suppose that the interest rate um, just uh, goes up or down, so changes once at the start of the uh, at the start of time, right? At time zero. So consider a one-time shock to interest rates. You could have more dynamics. It's going to get more complicated, but the intuition will come across with a one-time shock to interest rates. Let's further assume that deposit rates are proportional to the market rate. So beta just like in the data, right? This is what we saw, so it's not a uh, 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 costly assumption to make. Deposit rates are proportional to market interest rates with beta is the proportionality uh, of that, okay? Uh, let's suppose that following the shock, so after the dust settles, uh, deposits just decay at a constant rate delta. Think of this as the natural shrinkage of deposit base, uh, capturing the fact that people don't stay forever, even if they're not running or anything. So um, given these assumptions, let's do the following. First, uh, let's rewrite the value of the bank slightly. Instead of just assets minus liabilities, you can think of the liabilities of kind of having two pieces. First, D, this is contractually what you owe your depositors in the sense that this is the, uh, this is the number of dollars that, 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 that you've taken in and that are now uh, on your books as a liability to depositors. That's, of course, part of your liability. However, since you're paying on those liabilities a below market rate, you're earning a spread. Well, that spread gives you an additional asset, the deposit franchise. So we're now going to decompose the value of the bank as, of course, it's asset minus liabilities, but decompose liabilities in terms of the book value, what you owe, plus the deposit spreads net of cost that you're earning uh, the present value of that. And let's call that the deposit franchise. Well, with our assumptions, the deposit franchise has a very nice intuitive form, right? This is the present value of all future spreads net of cost. So what is that? Well, it's the amount of deposits that you go in. Uh, and here we're, uh, for now, just assume no runs. Runs are coming on the next slide. So this is the deposits that you have. On each deposit you have, you're paying beta in uh, interest. So one minus beta is the spread that you're earning. One minus beta times the interest rate. These are your profits right now. Right. This is and then this is so that's your deposit spread, what you're earning. But from that, you have to subtract the cost of running the deposit franchise. So spreads net of cost. This is like the uh, the, the, the income uh, net income that you're earning on, on deposits. And then we're taking present value of all that in the future. So then you have to divide by the interest rate plus the decay rate, R plus delta. This is uh, taking that present value to today. So that's the functional form uh, for the deposit franchise with these assumptions. It's nice and simple. And what you immediately see 
is a deposit uh, franchise uh, has negative duration. Its value goes up when interest rates um, go up, right? So it, it's increasing in interest rates as opposed to decreasing. So that's in the parlance of bond uh, world, that's negative duration. So what, how do you do? See it here, just take the derivative with respect to the interest rate and you get a positive number. Okay, so that's uh, uh, intuitive. Um, okay. But now let's think about runs. So you have this asset now, it has negative duration, so it the deposit franchise is appreciates with interest rates. So let's see what happens. Um, well, uh, in order to have runs, imagine having part of the deposit franchise be uninsured. So DFU stands for uninsured deposit franchise. The value of the bank is gonna be, again, assets minus deposits, but now plus the insured franchise, that, that's, that's, that's fine, that's there. But the uninsured deposit franchise is only there if people stay. So let lambda be the fraction of people who remain. And so the uninsured deposit franchise times lambda is taking into account the fact that some might leave, in which case the deposit franchise that they bring to the table gets destroyed. Um, when would people leave? Well, uh, think about the fraction that, that, that stay, lambda, as an endogenous function of the health of the solvency of the bank. So we're imagining uninsured depositors who are looking at the stock price or the earnings or something like that and deciding whether or not to run based on how concerned they are. Again, just like in the paper that Hyun showed this morning. Uh, so we're gonna consider a simple threshold strategy where uninsured depositors run if solvency is below a threshold and they stay if it's above. You can have a smoother version using global games, but we're not. We're, we're just gonna focus on the extreme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They could, think of them here as going to a money market fund or something like that. But it, a very interesting extension would be maybe they go into the largest banks, the JP Morgans of the world. Uh, th there's some interesting general equilibrium implications of that, but maybe we can leave that for the Q&A. For now, just think of them as going to a money market fund. Okay. Uh, so what is this bank solvency going to be that people are running based on? Well, it's the, it's the value. Um, so the value of the bank, given how many people stay, is the value if everybody leaves plus... For the people that stay, fraction of the uninsured that stay, these are the profits that you make on them. So that's part of the, uh, the solvency of the bank. An equilibrium is when the number of people that stay given the solvency is consistent with that being the solvency, right? So it's a fixed point in that space. And the result that we have is that as long as the bank is sufficiently valuable um, uh, given no run, uh, so, so as long as the bank is solvent, if everybody stays, then at least one equilibrium is the good equilibrium where people stay, right? That's the good uh, uh, diamond divic type of equilibrium. However, if the value of the bank, uh, if everyone leaves is below the threshold, then there will also be a run equilibrium. And that doesn't matter how liquid the loans that the bank has are. They can be perfectly liquid again. So this is something that you don't usually get. Uh, it's the illiquidity of the deposit franchise, if you will, that is giving us that result. What does this run equilibrium depend on? Well, it's going to be more likely to arise if there are more uninsured deposits. But more importantly, perhaps it's going to be more likely to arise if the beta of those uninsured deposits is lower, if you're paying them less. So if you're building your franchise on uninsured deposits on which you're assuming that you'll be paying very low rates, that's... Uh, that really describes SVB pretty well when you could see this kind of run uh, uh, emerge. And also it's more likely when the interest rate goes up because that's when this runnable asset, the uninsured franchise is very large. And so the run is very destructive, making it more likely in the first place. Okay, uh, this is just a, a picture to show how the run would work. Well, suppose that uh, you know, we have some uh, level of interest rate. I think of it a low interest rate where assets are equal to deposits. So just abstracting from equity for a second. What happens is that as interest rates go up, the value of the asset, including the insured franchise goes down, but then the uninsured franchise goes up. So the bank is still hedged for interest rates, right? If nobody runs, it's fine. But if people run, it's not fine, which makes the run uh, happen or at least be potentially to happen in the first place. Okay. Um, and so let me just, uh, in the interest of time, uh, skip to some of the solutions uh, that we have. So um, the risk management dilemma for the bank, the issue that, that this really highlights is that in a sense, the bank can't both hedge uh, runs so that not expose itself to runs 
and interest rates not vary not have its value vary with the level of interest rates because they demand two conflicting things uh, in order to hedge interest rate risk the bank has to stabilize its value outside of a run but to hedge against runs it has to stabilize its value if there is a run and the, there's a wedge between those two the wedge is exactly the deposit franchise that wedge moves with interest rates and so you can't with one uh tool con uh capture uh both so what might the bank do um so one thing that uh, we, we, we stress is that one solution to this uh, would be for, and again, costly because it requires paying for it up front. One solution for the bank would be to hedge, uh, use, it would be to use interest rate options. So why does the bank need interest rate options? Well, remember, the dilemma is that you're trying to hedge, prevent runs if interest rates go up. For that, you need your assets to keep their value, like your loans to keep their value if interest rates go up. At the same time, you also need the assets to rise in value if interest rates go down because in that world, your deposit franchise is unprofitable, right? So you don't wanna become insolvent if interest rates go down. So you kinda of need your assets both to rise in value if rates fall, not fall in value if rates rise, that's an option. You need an interest rate option. And so we characterize like the strike of the option and so on that has to happen. But the way for the bank to implement this would be to buy long-term assets, so just like banks do today, but layer on top of that, something like a, a swap option, a call option on interest rates. Um, banks do this already to hedge uh, the mortgage-backed securities that they have, because mortgage-backed securities famously have negative convexity. Well, the same is true, we're saying, of the deposit franchise. Deposit franchise has negative, gives the bank negative convexity, might need some options uh, uh, to hedge that. Um, again, this requires raising more capital up front, so it's not uh, costless uh, in any sense. But if you're going to build your deposit franchise on uninsured deposits and trying to make spreads off of those, given the runability that it has, it is going to require a solution uh, that is costly, something like this. And of course, if banks don't do it themselves by buying options, uh, then you could do it via capital requirement. The minimum capital requirement that you would need to take care of this problem is uh, to have the bank issue additional equity that is in proportion to the uninsured deposits that it has, um, the uninsured deposits that it has times the present value of the profits that it expects to earn on them uh, absent a run, right? So you need to make sure that there's always enough uh, additional value there to cover the deposit franchise if there's a run. And so you need that, that much equal to that uh, runnable franchise uh, in additional capital. And again, it's purely tied to interest rates. It's rate cyclical capital as opposed to the broader state of the economy or anything like that. The final thing that I'll comment on is, um, you know, one thing that the Fed did during the SVB crisis is um, um, create this program, the BTFP, where they lent to banks against their mortgage-backed securities at par. So those securities had declined in value uh, you know, so you bought them for 100, they're now worth 80, the Fed was still willing to lend 100 to you against that, right? So what's going on? Well, our framework gives us a way to think about that. What's really going on is, as those assets have declined in value, the deposit franchise, right, we showed is increased in value. And the two kind of roughly offset, maybe not for SVB, who, who was a, a very extreme, but for most banks, um, on average, uh, the two kind of offset. And so when you're lending against the assets at par, the assets are now worth less, what you're really doing is you're lending against the deposit franchise, right? Um, that wasn't, the, the policy wasn't uh, announced that way. I think that would be, uh, um, you know, an interesting uh, way, to, but it's a consistent way to think about it as lending against the deposit franchise. In our framework, that does have the potential to eliminate the run equilibrium. Uh, and so it's a lender of last resort um, opportunity. Okay, so just to conclude on this, uh, the point of the paper is that there's a new runnable asset in town. Even if your loans are perfectly liquid, you're, it's all treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, and highly, highly uh, HQLA, uh, having a bunch of low beta uninsured deposits, uninsured deposits that pay a low rate, uh, is a source of runs for, the, uh, for, for banks. Uh, and since the value of, of, of the uninsured franchise increases with ra rates, it means that the run risk or the liquidity risk that expose the banks to increases with rates, rates. It exposes banks to risk management dilemma where you can't simultaneously hedge both interest rates and run risk and liquidity risk. 
And so uh, the only way to solve it is, is with more uh, capital, either in the form of interest rate options or uh, rate cyclical capital requirements. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so, floor is yours, uh, uh, Annie Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure being here today and having the chance to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, just waiting for the slide slides to be loaded. Yeah, very good. So, as you saw, um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, as you saw. Uh, so like some other recent work by the same group of authors, uh, this, this paper sort of zoom in on the bank liability side, on bank deposits. And we all know that bank deposits are like certainly a source of instability for the bank because besides few exceptions like time deposits, there's always a rise for the depositors to show up in front of the bank and ask the money back. So essentially deposits are, most of the deposits are runnable and this is the source of liquidity risk for banks. But also, as Alexi was mentioning, bank, bank deposits are a very important source of revenue for banks because of what they call the deposit franchise. So essentially, banks invest initially in marketing, advertising, and other um, uh, um, things that uh, attract and lock in depositors. And in exchange, they are able to gain market power vis-a-vis -vis depositors, so they are always able to charge a deposit rate that is below uh, the, the benchmark rate. So, and uh, earning so a deposit spread that changes with the level of interest rate. So operating cost, the initial investment stays, stays the same, but then what they earn so is uh, changes with interest rate. So um, the deposit franchise is not free of risk because if rates fall, uh, then you already pay the investment up front, but you are not getting much out of it. So then its value decreases and this is a channel through which the bank is exposed to interest rate risk. And um, this is the deposit franchise is also sort of the ground where uh, liquidity risk in terms of run and of, or large withdrawals and interest rate risk sort of interact with each other because the value of the deposit franchise crucially depends on the depositor staying at the bank. So if there are withdrawals, then uh, the deposit franchise is uh, negatively affected because again, you, as a bank, there was an investment up front, but nothing that is coming back because this deposit is moving somewhere else. But also, this is very nice. Uh, this is really the nice uh, and uh, very uh, nice contribution of this paper is that the withdrawal incentive are also dependent on the value of the deposit franchise because it contributes to overall bank's value. And well, depositors cares about overall bank's value when they have to decide whether to withdraw or not. So this is the sort of the setting which this paper is moving. So everything, all the action will be uh, on the deposit side, very little about asset. And the question that the authors ask is, can the banks uh, simultaneously edge against the liquidity risk, so the liquidity there's a run, and at the same time the, uh, the interest rate risk? And uh, the answer that is provided in the paper is essentially a big no. So there's a, the banks are facing a risk management dilemma. And uh, changes in interest rate are, uh, might lead to bank runs. And uh, uh, even in a situation in which the bank is fully edged against interest rate risk. Because essentially, edging against these two types of risk requires a very different strategy in terms of portfolio composition. So if you want to get rid of runs, OK, you invest in short-term assets. In, uh, so you match uh, the, the, the duration of, uh, of your deposit with that of, uh, of, of your asset. But if you want to um, insure against the interest rate risk the way I describe it, so you I made an, an investment up front and you're earning something that is floating, then, then you have to uh, invest in sort of long or have enough uh, long-term fixed rate assets on your balance sheet. So what the authors then discuss in the paper is that essentially the banks cannot do a both of them cannot perfectly edge against these two types of risk. And then uh, they're, they're, we need the other instrument. So either we need an intervention by someone else, so the lender of last resort, we need to think about capital requirements, so a regulator that's a pin and a prescribe the banks to do something, all capital, or the banks itself has to think of different assets that have a convex payoff like options to deal with uh, this, uh, this management dilemma. Um, and well, I know that this is a theory paper and uh, I'm a theorist, but yet I decided to reduce, shrink uh, the, the, the description of the model to like three bullet points, which was a really big sacrifice. But this is because the model is very neat. So I'll, I'll only discuss some, some of 
of, of the elements of the model. But this is a discrete time fi infinite horizon model with multiple equilibrium. This is very important. And banks have market power uh, over the depositors. And this is what determines the value of the deposit franchise. Um, uh, and um, there's an interest rate shock that hit the economy at the initial period, and, and then it stays the same uh, throughout. OK, so my overall take on the paper, this is very interesting. I uh, suggest everybody to read. It's extremely policy relevant. Uh, the model is stylized, but yet uh, you have all the ingredients that are that you can recognize and connect to the current to the current current event and the recent event. So you are really have a lot of uh, insight about why we are observing this instability now, only for a small group of banks, not for the for the whole banking sector, and why in this interest rate cycle and not before. So there are a lot of you really can really connect the single variables of the model to to the poly, more general policy uh, policy discussion. So this is uh, uh, really wonderful. The model is stylus, but yet it's quite intricate. So there are a lot of things that are moving. And what I will try to do in this in the discussion is to sort of focus on some elements of the model. So I'm um, so one element is uh, the withdrawal. So this is really the center and the contribution of this paper. Withdrawals are partly endogenous, but my thinking is what are, if we are really microfunding the deposits withdrawal? Uh, yes, sorry. What if we are really microfunding the deposits withdrawal decision? What can we learn? Uh, can, what can we learn from there? And sort of related to that, if we have to think about what banks will optimally do, so if we think that they want to solve a maximization problem and try to think uh, how much of each type of risk they are willing to um, to suffer or to uh, to have, uh, how 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 this will work? So let me start from from the withdrawals. So I, this is not really the terminology in the paper, but there are essentially two different types of withdrawal you have seen in the presentation. One are the normal withdrawals. I call them normal because they happen all the time. They can happen for any possible level of interest rate. And they are just the result of an investor that says, okay, so that's the interest rate, the deposit rate. This is the deposit spread. This is the value of the alternative outside opportunity. There's cash always there for me as, a, as an option. So what should I do? Should I keep my deposit into a bank or should I move them somewhere else? And it is not where withdrawals occur because as interest as the deposit spread increases, then um, then the deposits might find optimal to move out of, of banks and in alternative investment opportunity. So this substitution is only possible to a certain extent. So these normal withdrawals are not going to occur, I think, at very high level of interest rate because then the cost of cash is extremely high. And banks need something like cash or deposit uh, in order because they, they provide liquidity services. So their substitution into mutual fund is not perfect because they don't provide such a service, such a, such a liquidity service. And then uh, there are another type of withdrawal. So they are the diamond and DB kind of withdrawals. That's, uh, I think, the way to call it because they are like a... Uh, out of pure panic. So there's some strategic complementarity in the model. And I'll, I'll, I'll get there in a second. And then uh, so um, the depositors find the optimal to withdraw when they expect everybody else to withdraw. So that's why they are like a that sort of a diamond, in the, a, a label diamond in the big kind of withdrawals. And this occurs when the, the deposit franchise is high. So when the deposit franchise is high, which is the case when the interest rate is high, then um, the deposit franchise is really the dominant part of the bank value. And uh, since the, the value of the deposit franchise depends on the people staying at the bank, every in the marginal depositors know that if he leaves, then there's a big drop in the deposit franchise. And if you extend this argument, you can think that if everybody else withdraw uh, and I'm the only one that stays at the bank, well, the value of the deposit franchise will be extremely low, the bank's value will be hit severely, and I'm here, and uh, maybe the, the value of the bank has uh, gone below the solvency threshold, some threshold of survival in which I know that I will get the I will get repaid and I will not be better off just leaving. So again, it's a diamond and DB kind of withdrawal because I don't want to be the one left in the bank if everybody else withdraw. And in the current version of the paper, the two kind of withdrawals are treated 
quite separately. So the first one are characterizing an economy in which there are essentially insured depositors, and uh, and the second one instead are like uh, and play like a lower bound of the the deposit the diamond the withdrawals the overall withdrawals in the model with uninsured. So I was thinking whether they could be sort of linked to each other. So think that you only have uninsured and think that um, these uninsured are also playing the same kind of reasoning of the first uh, guide that when I described the normal withdrawal. So thinking whether they want to leave the money at the bank or not, as if they were the only one. So only for sort of fundamental reason, they only cares about whether the bank is solvent and they will be able to be repaid and whether keeping the money at the bank is uh, sufficiently profitable relative to, uh, to uh, different outside of opportunity. Then I think what you will get is a structure in which probably normal withdrawals or normal driven runs are like something that occurs at level of low interest rate and then the, the demand and dipping only at high level of interest rate and then and then a sort of what uh, the next step will be sort of start to think whether this the the risk management dilemma will always be present so when withdrawals or runs occur at low level of interest rate at high level of interest rate or whether this is this is something that is going to to only hold for uh, some value of interest rate and um so i think very quickly and then probably i have to stop here Yes, uh, so I think one of the another reason why to have a very uh, to to push a bit more on the micro foundation of withdrawals is that it allows to uh, potentially move away from the multiple equilibria that some pose some constraint. For example, the it makes very difficult to to be able to discuss exactly whatever bank will do. So say that the banks wants to ask to choose the asset portfolio composition or for example, the level of the, the, the deposit rate or the fix the deposit spread. Well, then it, it does so anticipating that will be exposed to some interest rate risk or liquidity risk. And if you have a probability of runs, uh, then you're able to solve this problem exactly and maybe even find something that is already in the literature so that this liquidity, um, this liquidity Liquidity risk and these diamond and DB grants that are completely inefficient um, are still worth to face, at least with some reduced probability, if you can gain something on on uh, on something else. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And sort. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, I suggest we uh, collect a few uh, questions also from the audience. Uh, there is. Uh, Three here, and there's one at the back, I think. Uh, thank you. This looks very, you know, a, a very interesting paper. So two, two issues. So one, you know, partly related to what the discussor was saying. So the, um, you know, you have withdrawals related to interest rates, and withdrawals related to runs, and you know, people imitating others. You know, the, I guess you know one way to, in which you could kind of think of it is 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 that people don't observe. Don't observe whether a withdrawal is due to interest rates or a run. I mean, this depends, of course, if if if, if you know the depositors are expected to to see what people are doing first in other banks or in the specific bank, so if they can observe. Um, uh, so you you can create this connection by simply observing the, that that the depositor cannot 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 see in real time whether you know the nature of the withdrawal. So it, 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 what motivates the withdrawal? Um, the other, I don't know if you, I mean, I, I was a bit late to your presentation, I don't know if you motivated, but I I know, that, so there is evidence that people don't switch banks and, uh, you know, somebody said that you are more likely to divorce than to change your bank. Um, not, not you, not you personally, I mean, I mean, I mean, Jerry, you, <laughs> you, you uh, collectively, <laughs> collectively, so, so that could be used as a, as a motivation for, for franchise value and, and also, uh, you know, Lack of competition, so because it, it seems to be—I mean, at least in Europe, it seems to be the case that it's very hard for people to switch banks. Yeah. So. Ah, thank you. Interesting uh, uh, presentation and um, a very interesting solution about the use of the options. But precisely on that, it, it's a very interesting solution for a few banks. But if we think of all the banks worldwide doing the same, where is the counterparty for that? Will be enough counterparties for close, for, for doing, for trading all the options? That's the question. Okay, uh, also thanks a lot for the interesting paper. 
I would have one question or suggestion um, related to deposits and their composition after a low for long period. So I know in Europe, I think un uninsured imposit, uh, deposits are not so important, but we know that in many countries, overnight deposits are now a much bigger share than in the past. So many of these might not be like traditional sticky deposits because they're actually not held for transaction purposes. So I was just wondering what you think that, I mean, adding these type of deposits in your framework could actually do and might be an interesting extension, might be relevant uh, also for Europe. A very interesting discussion. A couple of comments. If you look at what um, both European and US banks, the way they've dealt with this problem over the past 10 years is, I think typically the rule of thumb is that most banks would be holding fixed assets worth, say, 20 to 30 percent of the deposit, right? So I think all banks understand that you cannot fully hedge or you cannot assume that all the deposits will be there and that the deposit bit as a composite of different behaviors. Uh, so, so they break down behaviorally the different deposits and they say, okay, that's behaviorally, I'm still going to have 30, 35% really stable deposits at zero. I can hedge these and, and that gives you a bit of, gives them a bit of room for, for the more volatile deposits either to leave or to become more, more expensive. So that's how they decide to strike, strike the balance, which you can think of it as kind of almost dynamic hedging, right? As opposed to like in like a synthetic alternative to actually the uh, the option. So that's uh, that's one uh, one point. The, the second one is um, I think it's an interesting discussion to think whether or not, whether or not uh, there's such a distinction between the way in which an insured and uninsured behave. I think if if you have an account at the bank and the bank is in the newspapers every day. Even if your deposit is insured, you probably take it out. You probably do not want to have thirty thousand dollars in a bank that's, you know, where there are rumors you will go bust. Because why would you? Especially, it's, it's, it's very easy to move things. So just in case you will move the money to J.P. Morgan, and, and then you'll see, right? And and then there's there's a whole very interesting discussion about the role of convexity in what's happened in the U.S. Right? Which feels like a very aggressive way to to hedge interest rate risk because I think a lot of the losses comes from the way convexity has behaved in the in the in the widening of the spread between mortgage backed securities and long trip term treasuries. And if you look at Europe, um, most most of the interest rate hedging has been done in shorter durations with no convexity, right? So, so with even with swaps or with government bonds with a three, four year duration. And that feels like a more reasonable way to manage it as a, rather than buy an MBS, an MBS that you think has a th four year duration and then the duration becomes 20, 20 years, right? So, but that's a kind of a completely separate discussion, but I think it contaminates the problem a little bit. Others, maybe one more. Yes, background and from FinFSA. I mean, uh, Americans, they uh, go with uh, the 30-year mortgage and with a spread of almost almost 3%, I understand. And and uh, what about variable rates? I mean, how, how, what, what do Americans think of variable rates? All right. Awesome. Um, first, thank you, Anise. I really liked your discussion. Really appreciate uh, your comments, and I agree with uh, some of the questions you asked, like microfounding um, uh, deposits and uh, the interaction between uh, the two different types of withdrawals. It actually kind of came up in, in, in some of the questions. Um, they're definitely linked, and so you know, we, in the paper, we tend to separate them, but but they're linked in the sense that they both erode the deposit franchise. So people leaving the bank at high interest rates, either because they're just looking for a high interest rate at a money market fund, or because they're concerned for the run, uh, they both diminish the deposit franchise. And in that sense, one can be the spark for the other. So I think one of the ways in which SVB really happened is over the last year, they were already bleeding deposits, not because there was a run, but because these large accounts were moving to money market funds. And that then uh, worsened the exposure to the run and 
potentially precipitated. It's very much related to your question too. Like what happens if on top of that, people can't even tell why their withdrawals, is it because of interest rates or solvency that would like then further link them and make them interact and, and amplify and compound each other. Uh, so it'd be an extra source of this problem. Um, um, you're totally right that people don't switch costs, uh, banks, unless they get divorced. I mean, pretty much, uh, I, I think, true. This is, you know, we, we have a series of papers about banks, market power, and deposits, and this is exactly where it comes from. It comes from the low propensity of people to switch banks. Banks are very good at uh, kind of uh, keeping people and making that relationship as sticky as possible. Um, I, I'll link that, in fact, to, to, to the third question, which is the too low for too long. It's, it's, it's exactly... What I think happened is um, because interest rates were at the ZOB for so long, you had no incentive to switch banks. I think there's like a whole generation of people that never even really had to think about it. Um, and so uh, the banks perceived deposits as having become stickier. I mean, I think there, there's um, uh, anecdotal and you know evidence in the press for that during COVID. Um, you know, bank CEOs were saying, well, these are probably going to be pretty sticky deposits. And so we got to put them to work and so on. Um, and, and so it did change the composition um, and, and may have um, the, the bad thing is that that may have contributed to, to why when interest rates then did go up and people were uh, as surprised as they were. But the good thing about it is that it means that we're less likely to see this kind of problem in the future. Right. So so um, because uh, it's less likely that we'll have these giant accounts sitting uh, accepting zero interest rates. Uh, so, so maybe that's the positive. Um, uh, I, I love the question about who's the counterparty for the options. I think that's a, a key question. It kind of came up when Klaus asked during the talk, which is um, the, the natural provider, if there is one, there might not be one, in which case these options are expensive and, and, and would um, uh, that would make it even costlier. But one natural source would be the banks that experience flight to quality, right? The JP Morgans of the world where that's where the deposits go uh, during the run. And so these are banks whose deposit franchise actually grows at that time. And so they might be natural providers, a natural counterparty. But again, it's not clear if the supply would be enough uh, given the demand and the price might have to be high enough to induce other sellers. Um, so I, I, I totally agree uh, that it uh, really comes down to a behavioral assumption about the deposit beta. I think that's what was so difficult about this going into this period. Betas had been trending down. I think some banks, not all, the ones, some would look good in hindsight, but others uh, assumed that de these deposits would be pr stickier than before or, or, or stickier than they turned out to be. Uh, and so that was part of the, 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 the issue. I, and I totally agree that the line between insured and uninsured can get blurred. Um, it is the case. Now, I think in the U.S. in March, what we saw is that really the, the insured kind of stayed. Um, not everybody, uh, totally not, but uh, that was one uh, good thing. Imagine if there was a run on insured deposits as well. Uh, for the purposes of our model, you can think of the insured really as being the sticky ones and the uninsured as the flighty ones. And what that maps to in the data, given the blurriness that you pointed out, uh, would be an issue. And uh, the convexity, I don't have a great answer for. Uh, I agree. And mortgage spreads are at a record high precisely because of this. And why are they over 300 basis points in the U.S.? It's because of the convexity. It's very high right now, and it's very expensive. Um, I think banks have pulled back from mortgage lending uh, partly because of this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks very much uh, again, uh, Alexi and uh, Anisif.